So thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, we're really excited today um, to have uh, Sarah Bermeo from Duke University presenting at our um, refugee seminar series. Um, Professor Bermeo is a political economist. Um, she's an associate professor of public policy and political science. Um, she's also the co-director of the Duke Program on Climate-Related Migration, some of the, talk, um, the, the work she'll be discussing today. Um, her broader research lies at the intersection of international relations and development, focusing on foreign aid, migration, climate change, and how these areas intersect. Um, in addition, she has a number of um, you know, top-notch journal articles, some great public-facing publications from uh, institutions like the Brookings Institution and the Monkey Cage, and she's the author of um, a book, Targeted Development, Industrialized Country Strategy in a Globalizing World from Oxford University Press. Um, so um, Professor Bermeo has graciously offered to accept questions throughout the talk. Um, uh, those of you who are watching online, um, please um, sort of enter your question in the chat function of Zoom, and Teresa will be able to pass it along to the speaker. Um, uh, without further ado, we're really excited to have uh, Professor Bermeo here today. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation yeah. to be here and also for that very kind introduction. Um, as you heard, I'm going to be uh, discussing some work that I have in progress. Um, it is part of a relatively new research agenda for me um, that is leading on to some follow-on projects, but this is the one that is at the stage where we can present it, and I'll talk a little bit about some of our next steps um, at the end. So um, this project grew out of an interest of my own in understanding migration from Central America as it started to increase in the um, you know, mid-2010, uh, so around 2014, there was this uptick in migration from Central America. It went back down. And then 2018, 2019, we saw a huge increase. And um, both myself and other people, like I freely admit this, um, in 2018, I was still writing pieces attributing migration from Central America to violence. And um, what we started to see, though, when we, the people who were actually coming to the US southern border, many of them were coming from rural areas, and many of them were arriving as part of family units. And so this, to me, seemed new, and I wanted to explore it some more. It was kind of difficult to explore with the data that were available at the time. So what I'm going to do today is kind of first talk a little bit like big picture some of the interest we're seeing in climate-related migration, um, which is part of the, the broader research agenda here, and then kind of delve down into the Central American case, um, talk about both the, the findings that we have, but also some implications those might have for policy, particularly U.S. Um, policy toward the region, um, and then talk about some, you know, a, a give a little bit of information about some of the areas where we're going next with this. So there has been a huge, and I would say growing interest, um, not just from the academic community, but even probably more so from outside the academic community on climate-related migration. So we've seen kind of newspaper story after newspaper story, um, you know, the century of, of climate migration, um, why we need to plan for the great upheaval, like this kind of, you know, not this language around it that's really like, this is going to be a massive thing that we need to um, think about. What are climate migrants? I actually don't know the answer to that. And where are they moving? Again, I actually don't think we know the answer to that um, for the most part either. Um, climate migration growing but not fully recognized by the world. I think that's probably pretty fair. Um, in the face of climate change, migration offers an adaptation strategy in Africa. So this is actually something that is a growing understanding among academics is thinking about migration itself. So we think about adapting so that you don't have to migrate, but thinking about migration itself as an adaptation strategy to climate change. Um, the looming threat of sea level rise in Bangladesh, I mean, this is actually one of the places that gets the most attention when it comes to thinking about um, the intersection of climate change and migration, because sea level rise in Bangladesh is really causing large numbers of people to be moving um, toward, particularly toward Dhaka, where they're living in you know, pretty precarious both economic and climate um, situations. Once, once once they move. Um, and the um, huge floods that happened in uh, Pakistan that affected, I think, something like a third of the country or something like that um, within, you know, uh, this is, most people will probably remember this because these are big headline news. Um, World Bank report 
um, the groundswell report that came out in uh, 2022 where the World Bank was really focusing, this was the second of two reports on this issue, um, really focusing on you know, the, trying to project where climate migration, where we were supposed to see the most climate related migration in the future, um, as, um, as well as where people would be likely to move both from and, and to. Um, and then the Biden administration um, coming out with a report specifically on the impact of climate change on migration. So really tr starting to focus, you know, both internationally at the World Bank, also domestically in the US, policy on this idea that there's, uh, there is a link between climate change and migration. Um, I would argue we actually don't understand it very well. And part of that is because there are huge data challenges in, in um, kind of unpacking this. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along. Um, so what are some of the drivers? Again, this is just big picture, but the one I'm going to talk about most today is the top one there. Um, but just for people who might be interested in the topic more broadly, what are some of the drivers of climate related migration? One is this kind of, um, you know, obviously warming, but also precipitation changes. And by precipitation changes, those are actually can come in numerous different forms. So some places are experiencing uh, lower than average um, rainfall. Some places are experiencing shift in precipitation patterns. So maybe overall they get the same amount of rain, but it doesn't fall at the same times. Um, an increase in extreme events of la large amounts of rainfall, um, so which can be particularly devastating if you actually follow lar if large amounts of rainfall follow a particularly dry period because then the ground is hardened and can't absorb it. So you actually get more instances of um, flooding and, and, and landslides. Um, what, we're gonna, what I'm gonna focus on today in Central America, one of the big things um, that we are seeing is uh, impacts on agricultural yields. And there have been some studies now, um, not linked to migration, but just some studies on agricultural yield that show that these are happening like much more intensely. Uh, the studies have come out in the last year or two suggest these impacts on agricultural yield are um, happening much faster and more intensely than what was predicted even say five, 10 years ago by the models that were happening. Um, and that this is affecting both uh, the, you know, the amount of the yields of crops, but also the nutritional value of crops. Um, and so that this is having you know, a, big, um, a big impact, particularly, and this is unfortunately so much of what we see with climate change, particularly in the areas where people are already poor, where yields were probably already relatively low. Um, and you know, and this, it tends to be clustered around the, tr the tropics. Um, and that's being coupled, as you might imagine, with big increases in food insecurity. Because if you have less yields, um, you're going to have um, you know, a, lot, a, lot less, um, a lot less food security to go with it. Uh, it's not on the slides here, but like globally, just to kind of, because I'm going to be talking about smallholder farmers in Central America, to give you a sense, these are not my statistics. I actually don't know 100% how reliable big aggregate statistics like this are. But the best estimates out there is that um, globally, there's about 500 million smallholder farmers and they collectively produce about a third of the world's food supply. So when you think about that, right, the idea that smallholder farmers who are on the front lines of climate change are something that we should all be concerned about, even if it's not for you know, altruistic reasons, we're talking about a really big portion of the global food supply, which as if we learned anything from things like the Russian invasion of Ukraine, impacts on the food supply in one place end up having ripple effects throughout the global economy for food. Um, so I would argue, you know, if I'm, if I'm talking to government um, or international organization, you know, policy advisors, one of the reasons we really should care about this is that this is going to be a big global impact for everyone, not just, I personally think we should care about it just for the sake of the smallholder farmers, but from a big po grand policy perspective, there are also reasons to care about this for global food security. Um, some of the others that I'm not really actually going to talk about um, in my talk today, but just kind of for completeness, um, because other people might be interested in other aspects of climate change that could drive migration. Um, ocean warming is having an impact on fisheries. Again, small-scale small fishers are um, you know, um, heavily um, affected by this. Sea level rise is driving people from the coasts inland. Um, floods, storms, heat waves, fires. Um, and one of the things, and this actually becomes pretty key, um, climate change is intersecting with a lot of existing drivers of migration, which 
um, you know, is maybe particularly then tragic for the people who are already having these kind of art negative impacts and then you layer climate change on top of that. It also makes it a particularly tricky issue to study from a data perspective because how do you disentangle these issues of, you know, climate change when most people don't migrate just for climate change. There are, I think you could argue maybe like small island states might be an exception for, to that, but climate change coupled with, you know, good policies, good governance, low levels of violence um, doesn't necessarily cause people to migrate and particularly doesn't necessarily cause people to migrate internationally. So one of the things that I'll say when I'm talking to, giving a talk to kind of a broad audience is people may leave their homes for climate change, but they don't leave their countries because of climate change. If you're leaving your country, there's something else going on that is um, you know, be intersecting with climate change. Again, I say small island states might actually be an exception to that rule. Um, there are not at some place that I've studied particularly myself though. Okay, um, so now um, to ground this a little bit in kind of academic theory, um, there's nothing new about studying the relationship between migration and income. And a lot of what we're talking about with, say, climate shocks to smallholder farmers is a change in income. Their farms are not going to produce as much as they produced before. Um, so we should be thinking about, you know, how does this way of thinking about um, particularly kind of slow onset climate change as opposed to a wildfire or something that kind of comes through very quickly and creates more of a natural disaster situation. The impacts of climate change in the agricultural sector are more impacts on people's income, lifetime well-being, you know, their projections about how they're going to be doing in the future. And there is a fairly rich literature on the relationship between migration and income, which I want to argue actually doesn't tell us much about um, climate related migration. And the reason is, so let's kind of look at that. Um, I believe everything on this slide, actually, except for the very last part, maybe. Um, so I think that there is overwhelming evidence that as countries go through kind of a normal growth process, we see this inverted U shape relationship between income and migration. And when you think about it, it's extremely intuitive. Right? It's also been documented by lots of people who I put up there. But it's also just intuitive. And when countries are really poor, people may want to migrate, but lack the resources and connections to do so. As countries get a little bit richer, they still are looking out there and seeing other countries where they could be better off, where the returns to their new education could be higher than where they are at home. And now they have the income, the, the money, to actually migrate. And then you get to a certain level of development and people have the income to migrate but no longer have the desire to do so because they can build the type of life that they want within their home country, right? So I actually think this is, I do not want to dispute this at all, right? Um, I think this is actually very robust finding in the literature. However, most countries, most of the time, are seeing an increase in their income, right? Incomes in countries tend to grow over time. So when we're looking at these cross-national relationships between income and migration, it's not surprising that we pick up this kind of aggregate effect, right? But what happens if income slides backwards, right? If we really believe that this is a relationship, this inverted U, as people get poorer, they should be less likely to migrate if they were on this kind of upward sloping portion of, of the inverted U. And what kind of drove me to this as an academic question is, that is just not what we're seeing in Central America. We are seeing people losing their farm income and deciding to migrate. So it was not explained by what we were seeing kind of in the economic literature, which to be fair, was not actually claiming that this was explaining backsliding, but they were making, and this actually comes up a lot in some of the policy work I do, these claims that because foreign aid is supposed to improve development, there's actually lots of debate about whether it does or not, but the people who are making foreign aid decisions are doing so in part because they think it, it um, improves development. And if that were true and you were giving it to countries and they were getting richer, you might actually be financing migration journeys. So you could actually see an increase of migration as foreign aid increased, assuming foreign aid were actually you know, um, having, having development um, benefits for the country. And so this is where I started to take issue because pe this is really sinking into the policy um, advice. Like maybe we don't want to increase foreign aid. Um, that's going to give people the development and the ability to move. And I was like, that is not what we're seeing. And so I kind of sat back and thought about it a little bit. Um, and, you know, at every stage, 
<coughs> one of the key things we know about migration is mo most people don't move. Right? So the, what makes the news, what we analyze are the people who do move, but most people don't move. And there's actually a growing body of, of literature on immobility and why, and why people don't move. But if you think about that, it actually then creates a selection effect. At any given income level, the people who wanted to move at that income level and had the ability to do so have left and left behind is a group of people that if everything stayed the same, actually weren't planning to migrate, right? Um, and now some of those people face a change in their expectations of their livelihoods where they are. So when they thought their country was on the upward trajectory, they were like, yeah, we're going to stay. We're going to work. We're going to contribute. We're going to be able to, you know, we're going to just keep getting better off where we are. Yeah, we might be better off if we move to Europe or the U.S. or Australia or Japan or something right now. But we see everything going in the right direction where we are. We're not going to move. If that changes and they no longer see that as the case, then that, that, is going, that has the a potential to influence their decision on, on migration, right? Um, what I think, too, is I, I don't actually know how to test this one. So this is more, this is, um, more just from my anecdotal observations of what I'm seeing. In the Central American case, I believe it is true from kind of, you know, a lot of time spent analyzing this and speaking with people um, in the field. People are facing the opportunity, the, the choice between migration today or not migrating at all. Because if they take their very little savings um, or ability to raise capital and reinvest it in their farm, which may not produce again next year, they may no longer have the ability to finance their migration journey. And so they're facing a choice of, do I reinvest in something that's failed multiple times, or do I decide to, um, you know, to migrate today because I think there's a very low chance that I'm actually going to be able to stay. And if I don't migrate today, I might not have the money left to migrate tomorrow because I'll have spent my limited savings and capital accumulation um, in reinvesting in my farm. Again, I don't actually know how to prove that, um, but that is kind of anecdotally what I would say we're see seeing. Anyway, um, from the policy perspective, I would argue that the implications of this um, for foreign aid are actually huge because there's a difference between thinking about preventing people from backsliding and helping people move <coughs> up the ladder, right? A lot of people, if they have hope that things can get better where they are, we know most people most of the time don't migrate, right? And so if they have hope that things can get better where they are, they are more <coughs> likely to stay and, and try that one more year. Um, and so I think there are kind of these, you know, big implications for how we think about that relationship between foreign aid migration, particularly in, in the climate change um, arena. Okay, so um, all of that is kind of like academics love to sit around and draw, you know, graphs and, and theorize. Um, what about some actual data? So this um, is joint work um, with some co-authors. Um, many people probably know David's name. Gabriella is a fantastic graduate student that we have at Duke. Um, she's really, really quite excellent uh, joint with the, with the law school. Um, and so this is some work that we have done. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a background um, on Central America, and then I'll dive into the data that we actually used. Um, so this is an, a region that is predicted to experience, you know, kind of increasing impacts of climate change going forward. It is already um, <coughs> already seeing them, and they are expected to um, to continue and to um, to get worse. Um, the precipitation patterns there are definitely changing. Um, if you talk to kind of any farmers on the ground, they just they 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 just see this. It's definitely happening, and you can also pick it up in the data. Um, so we're kind of, you know, seeing the data are showing something and this is being validated by the farmers on the ground. In particular, I don't know, does anyone here know anything about Central American growing seasons? I didn't um, before I started looking at this. Um, there's many places in Central America have two seasons. Some have three, but most of the places that we're looking at, most of the farmers have two growing seasons. One that is in the um, planting in the early spring and then harvesting in like June, July, and another that plants in like July, August, and then harvests later in the year. This is particularly relevant, like why am I giving you an agriculture in Central America lesson? It's particularly relevant because there's this um, period in the middle, uh, in the July, August um, time frame. It's called the Cunicula. And it is, um, it's, it's not new. I don't want to say it's always been there because I don't know what always means. But like for the, for the time that we have, you know, data, there's always been a dry period in July and August. But 
it is becoming drier and longer. And the impact that this has is that it um, affects the harvest from the first planting as well as the planting for the second season. And so you can end up losing the majority of two crops in a row if this canicula period um, is, you know, is, is changing and becoming uh, more intense. And that is, what, that is what the data are showing us. Um, what we saw in the 2014-2015 period was a drought in Central America. I'd say this is one of the things that first kind of piqued my interest in it, but not in an academic type of way, just in a, I've studied Central America before. And in 2014-2015, the, the famine alarm bells were starting to go off. Um, it was, they were one step away on the kind of, you know, the people who declare famines, right? Um, one step away, literally, on the scale from declaring a famine in Central America. Like, famines don't happen in the Americas, right? Like that, like, not like climate caused or farming caused famines like that. Um, and so this was like, this was something new. Um, and then 2018, again, there was a, a very substantial drought. And so you started to see really um, you know, strong impacts on farm yields and on the food insecurity indices for these countries. Um, so this was like a, you know, a big deal, um, particularly Guatemala and Honduras. Um, in Guatemala, it's just under 50% of the people are um, in rural areas, about 47% at last estimate. In Honduras, it's in the, um, it's in the, um, in the 40s, not, not quite as high as, as in Guatemala. So a large number of people living in rural areas, many of them indigenous, again, particularly in Guatemala. Um, and the food security situation at baseline, miserable. Um, these are some of the, prior to this, right, prior to these droughts, some of the baseline um, statistics in areas of Guatemala, rural areas, indigenous areas, some villages had something like 70% of children were experiencing stunting. So we're not growing correctly be, you know, before the age of five, 70%. Like that is, um, Guatemala is actually one of the worst countries in the world on some of these statistics for child nutrition. Um, and it's very unequal society, so this is being concentrated particularly in the rural areas. Um, so and agriculture makes up about 30% of the economy in Honduras, Guatemala. Um, a higher share of employment, but, um, but of, in terms of economic activity, that's about what it is. Um, and then um, when you look at the agricultural practices that are in place there, they, there's a lot that could be done um, to improve them just based on current knowledge for what works. Um, and so there's really this kind of, this doesn't really, this is going to impact more of the policy implications for later on, but I think it's important to note that you're, you're experiencing these impacts but you're also not nearly deploying the resources the best that you could, um, even you know, given current knowledge. Um, okay, so here's what we're seeing. Um, where we were particularly, uh, we got data from a Freedom of Information Act request that um, looked at, um, that provided data on subnational place of birth. Um, for migrants from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador for the period 2012 to 2019. Um, so why that is important is because, um, and we were particularly looking at, I should say, family units. So people who migrated um, with at least one child family member with them. So these are total numbers of migrants, but um, the, the orangish, reddish, whatever color that is bar, um, is showing the, these are total migrations from Guatemala over time from 2007 to 2019. Um, our data start in 2012, so that's where we can start tracking um, the numbers of those that were part of family units. And you see that that is rising, not just overall, but also as a share of the total, uh, of the total number of migrants who are coming, and, and significantly so. Um, I just kind of put up there on the side, I looked up what the more recent numbers would be. Um, there's a lot in the news. This is actually puzzling. It's never puzzling to me, really, when things are in the news that don't sound completely accurate. But um, <laughs> there, people keep saying, oh, oh, migration, and in the news, it's like migration from Central America is going down, and now we're seeing more people from Venezuela and from, um, from uh, Nicaragua and from Haiti. You know, that the latter part of that is true. <laughs> we are seeing, but um, it is still true. I mean, Guatemala is still the third largest sender of migrants to the United States. Honduras is the fourth largest 
largest sender of migrants to the United States. These are relatively small countries, so that is actually a, a, a big deal. Um, so have they come down slightly comparatively to where they were in 2019? Yes. But, um, you know, I mean, we're still talking. So we were at maybe like 270,000 in 2019 migrants coming from um, Venezuela. We're still at 220,000, which based on the historical numbers is still really, really high. Um, so yes, maybe they've come down a little bit, but they're still, it's still a big deal. Um, and um, the percent of family units here, it rises to about like 70% in 2019. It's come down, but they're still the largest um, group coming from Guatemala, our, our families, people coming um, with, with children. Um, so the, the blue bars are data that we are just freely available on the website, and then we were able to put the family unit data in um, based on what we had. Again, these are at the country level. We're going to dive down deeper in a minute. Um, picture from Honduras looks the same. Um, that's, that's basically the only thing you want to take away from the slide is that the same thing is happening you know, across actually really similar numbers in, um, in 2019. Um, and, but also that huge growth in family unit migration as a percentage of um, of total migration and um, also you know still really big right now the only one that actually has fallen off um, in 2023 is El Salvador has fallen off some um, and um, you see even the numbers for El Salvador while going up never really reached those numbers that we saw uh, you know that 270,000 or so in 2019 from Guatemala and Honduras we're, we're not talking about those type of levels from El Salvador um, El Salvador is actually a less agricultural um, economy as well um, okay, so that's to kind of to give you the, the picture. Um, one of the things that surprised me when I started looking at this um, is um, really what's going to turn out to be the almost overwhelmingness um of the impact of agriculture and of rural location on, dri on driving these migration flows. I actually didn't expect that as much. Um, what we think of as kind of the traditional drivers of migration from Central America, which I think are still true, by the way. Um, poverty and, and lack of economic opportunity, food insecurity. Um, one that I always have to put up there and always say, this is, okay, the number one way to get yourself uninvited to talking at government things is this next one. Um, <laughs> violence related to drug trafficking, all of these drugs are bound for the United States. So this is completely being driven by the demand in the U.S. markets um, and by policies that the U.S. and Mexico took to tamp down on drug trafficking routes through Mexico that caused them to relocate through Central America and saw huge spikes around 2006, 2007 in homicide rates um, in you know, Honduras and El Salvador were kind of vying for the dubious distinction of you know, most homicides per capita um, in the world in the, in the um, mid-2006, 2007 range. Um, it's also true, so there's really kind of this like US <laughs> like market implication there, um, where drugs coming from mainly cocaine from South America up through Central America um, to the US market. Estimates of this are hard, but around like 90% of the cocaine in the US market um, comes that through, through those type of routes, um, like through Central America routes. Um, and um, guns. There's no domestic weapons manufacturing in Honduras, El Salvador, or Guatemala. The guns are from the United States, um, either left over from the Cold War or um, trafficked illegally southward right, on the border. We always think about security at the border coming northward. These are often guns purchased legally in the United States, but then trafficked illegally um, down to Central America. Um, there's a lot of extortion. There's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of poor governance. Um, and, you know, so those are, are things that I think are, are definitely on the table. Um, but then climate change, um, you know, kind of all of those things were pre-existing and then you lay climate change on top of it, um, particularly the droughts that, um, that, you know, that we're talking about. Um, here is the dry corridor of Central America, so like that brown thing. <laughs> um, and, um, it, you know, it is named that way because it, it does not get a lot of precipitation. Um, but it, Oddly, you might think, given that it does not get a lot of precipitation, um, has a lot of agricultural activity, per, um, particularly smallholder farmers and subsistence farming, or at least partially subsistence farming. Farming for yourself, but maybe then also having a job you know, on, a, on a bigger farm or something somewhere. Um, you can see it covers almost all of El Salvador and good chunks of the other countries. I don't have um, data on Nicaragua, though we are doing a project right now that is in Nicaragua. Um, Okay, so 
I said at the beginning one of the reasons that I think we don't know a lot about this is because about the relationship between climate change and migration is because it's difficult to measure. Um, part of that is because climate impacts, as I think everybody knows, vary within a country. So one part of a country may be affected by something that is not affecting the other part of the country, or at least not affecting it in the same way. Um, and data on international migration, particularly it's almost always at the country level, um, internal data on migration is almost non-existent. For countries that actually do a regular census every 10 years or so, you might get some snapshot of, um, and that we'll, we'll often ask in those questions too, like if people have moved, where have they moved from? So you might get some snapshot, but still it's at 10 year increments and not every country is doing a high quality census um, every 10 years. El Salvador hasn't done one since 2007. Um, any census, <laughs> not just a high quality one. They haven't done any census since 2007. Um, and um, the one thing that people, researchers started to do was survey, um, you know, to ask people if they were migrating, why were they migrating? It turned out that this, maybe a new wave of surveys would be better. Um, but for the most part, these surveys didn't ask enough questions to ascertain what was really going on. So people would say, why do you migrate? Well, I migrated be for, because I didn't have a job. But then if you asked another question, they might say, well, I didn't have a, I, you know, I was, I was looking for a job in the city and I couldn't find one. But then you ask another question and it turns out that they left their farm. And then when you ask another question, it turns out that they left their farm because it hadn't been producing the same way that it had been producing before. So you have to kind of really have detailed, dig down type of answers. And those type of surveys really haven't been done. Um, and it's not even clear that, um, that even respondents would necessarily go, trace that causal pattern. Um, so we were excited because we had these subnational data. So what we could do is we could say where in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala were people moving from, and what had been happening there. Had these been places, so I don't have to ask them if they were moving because of agricultural stress. I could measure the agricultural stress, um, or more, more, <laughs> more uh, clearly, the FAO could measure the agricultural stress and I could use the indicator. Um, so um, we were able to, to get these data. They have a subnational location of birth. We decided to do this at the department, which is their version of a state, so the first subnational level, um, and um, analyze these against um, subnational data on agricultural stress. Um, and just to give you a sense of where people are coming from, um, this is Guatemala. Um, these are numbers based on the, those Freedom of Information Act data that we have. And what they show is total numbers of migrants that showed up as part of a family unit at the U.S. southern border between 2012 and 2019 and were counted by the U.S., right? So they actually were count, they came in contact with a Customs and Border Protection official and they were, you know, counted. Right. Um, these are the numbers. So by the three highest sending departments, um, these are the highest percentage, the departments on the, on the left side, the departments with the highest percentage of out migration. And let me put that in perspective. That 7% right there means that between, and this is based on population in 2012 census. The 7%, 7 of the population number of Huehue and Tango in 2012 showed up between 2012 and 2019 at the U.S. southern border and was counted by a U.S. CBP official. That's a huge undercount in the total amount of migration because it doesn't count my internal migration at all. It doesn't count migration to Mexico, which is actually huge. Mexico is a huge destination for Guatemalan migrants, and they actually have some guest worker programs and other things um, in Mexico for Guatemalans. Um, and it doesn't count people who either migrated somewhere else or came to the U.S. and were not counted. The, the vast majority of this time were actually counted. People were just turning themselves in at the border. Um, so those are really big numbers. And in Honduras, we actually, I'll go back to that in a second. In Honduras, we actually see percentages, like more departments with those really high numbers. Those are really big, right? So I wanna show, I don't wanna do this for every country because it'll take too long, but just to give you a sense, in, um, in uh, Guatemala, the three departments with the highest number of apprehensions at the US southern border, so these are not the rates, but these are the three highest um, numbers. If you look at them, the per they were almost all, like the, the lowest was 68% rural population. <coughs> These are 
these are highly rural areas that people are coming from. This is not the picture that I think even still, unfortunately, the US government has in their mind about where in these countries migrants are coming from. Um, so just really quickly, same type of picture in um, El Salvador. And now let's get beyond the descriptive data and actually um, look at the analysis. So for those who care about this stuff, <laughs> if you don't, that's fine. Um, <laughs> the dependent variable here is, we, I use two different, um, or we use two different dependent variables. One is the natural log of the apprehension rate, which is the number of people per 100,000 population of that department. And another is just a straight up log of the number of apprehensions, okay? So, you might actually think, as I would say I did, um, that you would get a lot of movement in the apprehension rate, um, but that the number of apprehensions might not really be higher in rural areas because they don't have as many people. So they might be sending a higher percentage of their population, but maybe it's not necessarily an overall higher number of um, people. Subnational data on lots of things are hard. Okay, I'm just going to be clear about that right now. Um, I, you know, we chose here to separately analyze the three countries because I think there's actually differences across them. Um, we use a measure of the Agricultural Stress Index from the FAO, which actually compiles it at the department level, so we didn't even have to do anything with that. It was, um, it was there. It's very, it's, it, so agricultural stress here is actually, pr it's a pretty high stress category. Um, it's not just slight variations. It's like drought or just under drought. Um, so it's the percentage of cropland in a department that is experiencing this fairly high level of agricultural stress. Um, and we look at, if you remember earlier, I talked about this period of time called the canicula, which is really important. So we look at kind of the maximum monthly stress within a year that a country had, but then we also zoom in on that canicula period and say, does it really matter? You know, does it matter more if it happens during this time of this, of this dry period? Um, we control for the homicide rate um, at the department level, um, and that we do, we do have at a yearly basis. Um, the ratio, the you know, percentage of the population, um, or the ratio of the population is rural um, compared to the total population. That we only have from a t point in time, so I only have one number per department because it's from the census. Um, wealth index from the Global Data Lab, which is also only one point in time number, so only once per um, department. And then we put in a year trend variable because we wanted to just you know, account for yearly trends that might not be, um, you know, that might not otherwise be picked up in the data, especially because a lot of these are not yearly. Um, but our, our data on apprehensions are, so our apprehension data are by department year. So we do have yearly variation on that. Um, and so here's the actual regression model that we run, um, where I is department and T is time. Um, and random effects models, you can ask me about fixed effects or maybe I'll just talk about them afterwards. Um, robust standard errors are clustered on the department. The data are from 2012 to 2019. Um, and like I said, we use you know, two different um, dependent variables, okay? Um, all right, are we good? You said I could take questions during, but nobody's at, <laughs> um, so I think maybe they're all asleep. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Um, all right, so here are the results of the regressions. Um, don't worry if the numbers don't make a lot of sense because I'm gonna show you some marginal effects in a minute. Um, but first, just kind of raw, you know, what pops out. The top two, um, the top two rows are agricultural stress ratio, which is the maximum monthly um, shock that we see, all right, or amount of stress that we see. And then the second one is limited to that July and August period, so the maximum that we see there. Um, and you see that both of them are very you know, positively associated with increases in, there's a one year lag here, so having agricultural stress in year T minus one has a big impact in the number of, well, at least it's highly you know, correlated with the number of people showing up and being counted as part of family units at the U.S. southern border of the following year, okay? Um, what we really see, too, is huge impacts for the rural ratio. Something I did this time around that we haven't done in our previous presentations of these data, I took population out of the regression on apprehensions because I just wanted to see what it looked like when you didn't even control for population. So those raw apprehension numbers, or the logs of the raw apprehension numbers on those two um, you know, right-hand side columns are not controlling for population. So that's just saying if you, were, if you had higher agricultural stress or you were in a more rural area, you were sending more migrants to the US, not even controlling for the fact that you have a lower um, level of population. 
Um, and one thing I have to be really careful about here, the homicide rate does not seem to be picking up a lot. Um, I don't actually think that's because homicide rate doesn't matter. I think that's because that's kind of what was driving that, the regular level of migration that we were seeing anyway. And I also would argue, though I'm not you know, kind of a, um, you know, a, a crime or a violence scholar, there's some threshold effect that you, <laughs> that you hit where slight variations around it don't matter that much. So the cities in these areas are pretty violent, but they stay, they stay similar levels of violence throughout this time. So you might not be picking up the fluctuations. She's asking uh, if you want to address the possibility that multiple apprehension may be observation for the same individual. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's actually a great question. And it's one of the reasons that we um, have not gone back. So we originally, when we got the data, they only went through 2019. Um, the multiple, uh, multiple apprehension starts to become a much bigger deal from 2020 onward. Um, so while it can be a partial issue here, um, we're less concerned about it um, because in part, people coming with children were much less likely prior to 2020 to be turned back. Um, and so that was, so this is all before the remain in Mexico policies went into effect. Um, and so it was, if people, were deported, they were deported all the way back home and making that journey again with kids would be actually quite difficult and unlikely to show up here. But they also were just much less likely coming in that period with children to be deported. Um, and most, because most people were making asylum claims when they got to the border. And so um, with children under US law, children cannot be held more than three weeks, 30 days, something like that, in detention facilities, so they were being released. Um, and this was actually what led to the um, Trump administration's 2021 policies of separating children from parents because they weren't able to send them back. So since this is all family units, all people with kids, it's much less likely that they would have been returned back. That does change after COVID and after the Remain in Mexico policies go into effect, but not in these data. Yeah, yeah just as a um, two-finger, just how are you thinking about this? Um, so this is a really, I think policy relevant population to look at, which is this family unit migration relative yeah. to regular migration. But you know, it, you know, is it possible that what you're, the reason why the rural is picking up so much here is that that's the form that rural migration takes, whereas city migration is something. I'm just wondering how you're thinking about this in terms. Yeah. Of so I'm. So one of the things I'm thinking about is I need those data. So I've actually FOIAed those data now um, to try to get a better sense, so that we would be able to go back and compare. Um, kind of single adult migration to, so in this time period, this becomes the largest um, amount of a migration, but it's a, it's a good question that I, that I can't answer, right? Um, yeah. The, the second one is the, um, the, you know, if you looked into Mexican government statistics because of people, the, the, the people who are likely to stay in Mexico versus continue on too is the other. Yeah, so, um, not, so not as part of the analysis, I did kind of just do a little bit of a look at like, you know, who, because the Mexican government does also keep statistics on who they are encountering. Um, I mean, what a lot of people in the United States don't know is that huge numbers of people on their way to the US do actually get detained in, Me in Mexico and, de and deported back south, like before the US had policies with the Mexican government to, to do that. So um, you certainly saw, I don't know the exact numbers of it, but you certainly, I mean, Almost all of these people, or all of them, actually all of them travel, because this is just southern border, all of these people traveled through Mexico. S some percentage of the number who set out would have been detained in Mexico and sent back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just trying to think through something you said earlier, that you, more and more people are making a decision on whether to move right away yeah. or to invest in rebuilding something. And once they invest, they cannot no longer migrate. So could it be that one year lag might actually be too long of a period? Meaning that, if anything, these are conservative estimates because some people might move right away or have to move right away. Yeah, so it's, it's a really good question and actually thank you for asking it because um, something that I should have noted. So US fiscal years for when they've um, apprehended people actually end September 30th. Um, and so 
you actually have to lag it or you could be picking up October through December migration that um, so yes that could be true but since I don't have it on a monthly basis I can't disentangle that yeah I do look at different lags and you do tend to see still um, at the two-year lag mark a positive effect but then nothing like if you go back further than that I, I'm not seeing anything of course I only have like eight years worth of data so <laughs> that might be limiting my ability to get you know good lag structures too um, yeah I have a question. Um, so you showed that there were some regions where uh, people were migrating uh, much more than yeah. other ones. Isn't that picking up also like inequality actually in that uh, in those regions? I mean, there are poorer. I mean, compared yep. to other ones as well. Yeah, I think I think one of the th key things that kind of struck me um, about this is to kind of see that you know, that huge um, increase in migration over time, a lot of these people were coming from areas where in just kind of basic economic models, we would have expected them to have already migrated. Like the, the prediction of who would be left in these areas based on economics and proximity to Mexico and the United States should have been quite low. And what we'd actually seen was very, you know, not a huge amount of migration out of, out of these areas um, before that. And so a lot of it is, um, you know, tied, so indigenous communities very tied to their land, tied to the to the local communities. Um, it could, I mean, it could, I mean, attachment to place for for other reasons. Um, people have been on these farms; their families have been on these farms for for generations. Um, but you know, kind of just from an economic well-being perspective, we actually would have expected to see people migrate, you know, before, um, and and hadn't seen that. I actually think it really speaks to the level of desperation um, that these droughts ended up um, having throughout this, this time period on these areas. Um, because when you think about like what the, um, you know, what we were starting to see in US um, government policy, um, and you know, U.S. government policy toward migrants um, during these times was becoming was becoming tougher and tougher. You know, more and more, um, you know, crackdowns on um, you know on people coming, and yet more and more people coming. Um, the route between U.S. you know the route through Mexico is extremely violent. Um, lots of extortion, ri um, robbery, attacks, um, and yet people are not only coming but bringing their families with them. Um, and it really does kind of speak, and even after the child separations um, during you know, the Trump administration started happening, people are still coming. Um, and it was definitely not because there was a welcome sign out on the US. I mean, as US, US policy was becoming tougher and tougher, and more and more people were still coming. And I really think it kind of speaks to um, the desperation um, that people were feeling. There's something that we don't capture here, and I actually don't know how to disentangle it, um, even if we do get the more recent data. Um, in 2020, there are two major hurricanes that um, hit in Central America, um, two Category 4 hurricanes within two weeks of each other, um, Eta and Iota. Um, I, it, I don't know what, what that kind of does. So it's, but during this period, there, we don't actually have an instance of kind of major storms. The, the um, climate events in this period were more drought related. So. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is just kind of very quickly show you um, Honduras and El Salvador. Honduras, this is where I think it, um, you know, it's, it's actually quite interesting. We um, pick up the impact um, of agricultural stress, but only when we actually zoom in on that um, canicula period. The others are, those are p-values in parentheses, so the others may be showing something, but they're not, you know, we wouldn't consider them significant, um, but they're not like going in the wrong direction or anything. But um, really when we zoom in on the canicula period in Honduras is when we see it. Um, and then El Salvador, I have to admit this one actually um, surprised me a little bit because it is a less agricultural economy, um, but we, d we still see, you know, this impact both um, at the monthly level, but also the, during that canicula period um, as well. And so I thought that was, um, you know, that was actually, to me, quite interesting. Um, one thing, we don't know for sure, like I just know numbers of people and where they're coming from. I don't actually know if these were the farmers 
right? Um, and we anecdotally know because lots of people have, lots of groups have, you know, interviewed them and talked with them, but the actual numbers I'm counting, I don't know. But um, so what this is saying is if there was agricultural stress in an area, more people left that area. But it could be having ripple on effects, you know, that are affecting the urban areas within locations too. So it could be food insecurity if you're relying on the nearby rural areas for some of the food into the um, urban centers that this is actually having an impact too. Um, okay, so um, just to give you, so here are some of the um, marginal effects. This is zooming in on the canicula period and saying, you know, what happens if agricultural stress rises from its level at the 25th percentile to its level at the 75th percentile? What change do we see? Um, kind of holding other things constant. Um, what change do we see um, in appreh the apprehension rate or the number of apprehensions? And you, you see that like across the board, both for apprehensions and for apprehension rate, like these are big increases. This is not just like a statistically significant result. These are substantively quite large um, numbers that we're seeing in terms of increases of, um, of people you know, moving out. Um, and, and obviously, you know, if you, if you look up at like the 90th percentile, it actually was, it's almost asymptotic in some ways, so it goes up a lot. Um, okay, so I, um, what do we see? I said, you know, at the beginning I set this up as, um, you know, there's a discussion amongst um, policymakers on foreign aid about the link between um, foreign aid development and, and migration. There's certainly, um, in the U.S. government a discussion about foreign aid policy to Central America and how you can or maybe can't use foreign aid um, to decrease migration. So you would think that, um, given that, foreign aid might be flowing to the places where migrants are coming from, and it's not. Um, this is... Um, foreign aid, total U.S. foreign aid, and then agriculture and development food aid. So the blue bar, total aid, the green bar, agri um, agriculture and food aid, which is obviously a percentage of that total aid. And then the line, the gray line, is the percentage of U.S. foreign aid going to agriculture or development food aid um, as a percentage of total U.S. foreign aid. It is astonishing to me that that line has gone down over time. Um, and I've told the U.S. government this. Like, I just, can't, I do, I cannot fathom this. As we are seeing a huge mass exodus from rural areas in Central America, predominantly agricultural areas, the focus of our foreign aid has been shifting away from agriculture. I genuinely don't know why this is. Yeah. What are the areas that it's shifting to? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, we spend, the U.S. government spends um, a decent chunk of money on governance initiatives. In, um, in, this doesn't include military aid. So there could be other aid that's going on as part of whatever we call the war on drugs these days and, and that type of thing, right? But that would not be included here um, in, in any of the numbers. So on the development side, um, they are spending money on things like education and health. Um, but a large chunk of money is going into um, governance and, and civil society promotion. I would argue that there's absolutely no evidence that there's been any success in, in that, um, in spending on that. Uh, so it's not that I have anything against promoting governance and, and civil society. I think that would be a good thing if we knew how to do it effectively. Um, one of the interesting things is, I, mean, I think if you kind of look globally, foreign aid as, an, as you know, an ability to kind of build political or governance capacity. This does not seem to be one of the things that it does particularly well. Um, things that it has had more success at are health, um, especially things like vaccines or you know, chi like small child health, um, and agriculture. Like there's a lot, of, there are successful agricultural programs that you can draw on, including actually um, one of my follow-on projects is working to survey people who have, um, been in areas that have um, had water smart agriculture programs um, rolled out by um, Catholic Relief Services, a big international NGO funded by the Buffett Foundation, not funded by the US government. Um, and they're actually showing pretty significant results. And yet, you know, I've asked the people there, could you scale this? And they're like, sure, we could scale it. We don't have enough money to scale it. Um, so I think there is scaling potential out there. 
um, within these agricultural communities. There are practices that have been shown both globally, but now also within Central America. Those programs I'm talking about have only been being rolled out for like five years or so, um, showing really significant results, including during the 2018 drought. Being able to keep more farmers um, above the level where they would need external help um, than farms that didn't have these practices, um, and yet we're still not scaling up. So I don't, except for the fact that I don't know how to churn the I don't know if anyone else had a Charmette ship that is called USAID um, and actually get it to focus on new things. Um, it's not clear to me why we're seeing this pattern. This seems completely against the US you know, declared interests in the region, as well as again, I mean, this is, means that the people who are desperate enough to need the most help are also not getting the aid, right? Which is the smallholder farmers. Um, okay, sorry. So one yeah, um, uh, from the chat, it says that, how is that comparing um, of the agricultural budgets of the three countries? Um, so the budget of the Ministry of Agriculture of Guatemala, Honduras, and... Uh, you know what? That's an excellent question, and I don't have an answer to it. So I'm gonna, that's going to be like one of the things I will look up if I can actually find it, which I'm not 100% sure. Um, in general, these are countries that have relatively low taxation and low government expenditure. Um, and particularly in um, Guatemala, a long history of ignoring the rural, primarily indigenous populations. So my guess would be that not a lot of money is, is being spent there. Um, COVID also really um, showed kind of the lack of infrastructure in um, these, I'm probably sure in lots of countries, but I was looking particularly in these three, um, for dealing with, you know, for being able to cope with a crisis, which would include something like a drought. Certainly we saw it after the hurricanes in 2020 and, um, and with the COVID crisis, that there's just not the kind of governance capacity to deal with um, those types of situations, but it's a thank whoever it was because that's a fantastic question, and I will I will look it up. <laughs> so, or if she already knows, by all means. <laughs> um, okay. So um, here, oh, was there another? No. Okay. Um, so here are you know this is my last slide. Um, so you know, and kind of in conclusion, I think you know there's pretty strong evidence right now that within Central America. Um, we can, you know, we're seeing a high correlation between areas that um, experience high levels of agricultural stress and migration to the United States. Um, and I, this is predicted to just keep increasing, right? Um, climate change is having an impact now. It's, these are areas um, that are, you know, by all the, pretty much all the main climate models expected to be high impact areas for climate change. Um, so, you know, without help, there's not, you know, we should expect it to get worse. Um, but there is evidence that outside, and which I haven't shown you here, but is in some of the other work, um, you know, that outside ag um, agricultural assistance can actually make significant differences um, for, um, for smallholder farmers. Um, and so here are you know, kind of these next steps. One is we have already conducted the surveys. We're in the process of like getting them in and analyzing them now of um, smallholder farmers. In addition to these three countries, um, Nicaragua and um, uh, the Oaxaca area of Mexico. Um, where we have um, been able to ask them what their exposure is to these level of um, water smart agriculture um, trainings or demonstrations or, um, or just you know information there's been radio campaigns um, what we're trying to get at there is you know does increased exposure or um, more intense exposure to these programs um, have an impact on you know, they've already shown it has an impact on like soil health and things like that, but does it also have a follow on impact on um, other household decisions, including migration? Um, and so we're, we're looking to be, you know, one of the first that has really looked to tie a specific development program to um, migration des decisions. Um, and, um, but we're also looking there, which I think is actually really cool and not related particularly to this, but um, on um, information dissemination. So how do you, get um, information into the hands of, we think 500 million smallholder farmers worldwide, we're gonna have to figure out if we really wanna help them, ways for knowledge diffusion. Because a lot of the things that they're doing in Central America um, on training are things that you know people in the farming community and other places have known for a long time. Like don't burn your crops double. Like this is like agriculture 101, right? Like uh, because it's depleting the nutrients inside the soil. Um, other things like planting cover crops. Um, none of the interventions are actually that they're doing right now are high cost interventions because of course there's no foreign aid going to it. Um, so they're not. This is not like new irrigation systems or something. 
like that. It's planting cover crops, um, low tillage um, to retain soil moisture, um, you know, not burning, not burning crop stubble, planting trees to provide um, strategic shade and to prevent erosion. Like all things that also once done once can often be maintained by the farmers um, themselves. So fairly low cost intervention, except that the training is actually pretty expensive. So there are ways you can get the, find ways to disseminate the knowledge um, because when they actually go out and work with farmers, the uptake is quite high. Farmers are not resistant to it. That was my first question. It's like, well, do they say, no, this is the way we've always been doing it? They're like, no. They say, can uh, you help us change all of our crops over um, to this? So uptake seems to be high, but also very hands-on intensive in some of the programs. And so there are ways you can, um, you know, kind of do that with um, a less, um, less financially and, and people power intensive approach. Um, and then <laughs> this is my um, more, um, I, I, I have not actually started on this yet, but this is my like later in this year project is to use these data that um, I was just talking about today and see if we can see the climate migration models that have been predicting or I don't know if predicting is even the right word, estimating anywhere between like a couple hundred million and two billion people will move globally due to climate change. Um, obviously they can't all be right. <laughs> Maybe none of them are right. I actually think there's a big problem because a lot of them are using historical migration patterns to project the future. And one of the things we're seeing here is that that's this current wave of migration does not look like the previous waves of migration in Central America. So um, can we, you know, at least for these three countries, um, lo look at some of these models that are out there and see which perform better, um, you know, based on what we actually observed. Because again, most climate shocks are subnational and there's very bad data on subnational migration. And so that, would be, that is, is actually kind of a for me, a fun project that's on my horizon um, to look at. Um, okay, so that is all I have, and I'm happy to take any more questions. Thank you, guys. So yeah. I have a question um, just on what you were last saying, which is um, kind of like, you know, um, how the climate driven migration fits in with this broader, I would say, system of migration hemisphere. Because yeah. you kind of start with this interesting. Um, you know, uh, observation, which is that climate migration often means displacement within a country, not across countries. So yeah. We see this kind of pattern, and then, you know, we see some important shifts in this pattern of migration from Central America to the United States, but of course it's not new. And so I'm kind of, um, kind of curious to see how you see this, um, you know, the, the expansion of the dry quarter or the, more, the increased severity of the dry quarter fitting yeah. in with that longer term pattern. Or, yeah, you know. I mean, I, I, I think the real answer is we don't know yet. Um, but there's, there's a lot of discussion, I don't even want to say debate, but like discussion about climate migration in both policy and academic circles. And kind of, if you think of like a spectrum, like natural disaster displacement versus, you know, what we think of as traditional economic migration, where does climate migration fall on that? And I, I think that the answer is going to end up being it depends. Um, it depends on the, like the type of, so if, if it's you know, a one-off hurricane, um, even if that hurricane is more likely because of climate change, it's probably gonna more resemble natural disaster migration. If it is affecting your you know, ability to you know, see into the future a way to earn a living where you are, then it's going to lead to a more long -term. So natural disaster migration is usually very short um, in both space and duration. Right? People don't go very far and they tend to come back, at least large numbers of them. Um, whereas this is, seems, especially if you're taking your kids with you, like a more permanent form or at least attempted permanent form of, of migration. Um, but I think it's going to vary a lot um, based on geography of a country um, like, and, and literally geographic size, not population size, right? So if you have a large land mass, there are more places where people, there's more variation in climate impacts and more places where people can go internally to be free from or at least less affected by climate change. Um, I think also one of the things that's very hard to test, I don't think we can test it with these data, maybe with survey data we could, um, we're seeing uh, what we what I'm seeing right now. I can talk a little. I can s just mention it very briefly. The data we're getting from um, Nicaragua. One of the questions that we asked. It's like seven. We surveyed like 700 people. One of the questions that we asked was, "Do you um, 
you know, do you, has anyone from your household migrated in the last three years? Um, we ask that question both externally and internally. The external number is way higher than the internal number. Um, and so I think that in, in some cases it's, go, it's just going to depend on the, um, the attractiveness of internal migration options, which I would argue is actually lacking for many reasons in, um, in Central America, including in you know, El Salvador and Honduras, really high levels of gang activity in the cities, um, but also just Central America is going through the, the youth bulge right now. So there's not a lot of extra economic opportunity floating around if you do move from the rural to the urban areas. Um, so, but in other countries, Climate might affect them at you know, a different time in their development trajectory. They might have better institutions in place. They might have lower levels of violence. And so those internal options just might be more attractive. It's not clear to me where you go in some of these places to escape climate change. Like you're, you're on a narrow strip of land with oceans on both sides of you. Um, yeah, so yeah. No, but this also takes a long time because people who are in drought for years and years and years yeah. go to cities because there's nowhere else they can go. And then they stay there for a while, hoping for the best that something will give somewhere. Yeah. I mean, I think this is... It's not sort of straight to the U.S. border. Except that so. that's what we're seeing right now in Central America. And this actually is a, pretty, um, right. a way to slightly answer your question, too. I think the very fact, as you said, that this is not new migration, the fact that those networks already partially existed has been what has allowed this to happen. So like Migration Policy Institute did a survey of people coming from um, Huehuetenango in Guatemala um, who, had, who had migrated and almost none of them had, tried, had attempted internal migration first um, because they know what their cities, they know what the, the opportunities are like in their cities, but they also know from previous waves of migration what the opportunities are like in the United States. And we do know just from the migration literature that migrants tend to follow migrants, right? Um, and so I do think the very fact that what we're, some of what we're seeing in Central America is not doing that internal migration, because I think you're right, in many situations that is what we see. Maybe even historically in Central America, that is what we see. I don't have the data you know, to look into that, um, but it's not what we're seeing right now. And that I think is, uh, was a surprising pattern, because we were, we were not sure what, you know, what would show there, but it really does seem like within you know, a very short space of time of having these stress, you're moving out. Um, so yeah, we were a little, we weren't sure, um, but yeah, we were a little surprised by it too. Yeah. So I have uh, uh, two questions, and this was really, really you know, interesting stuff. Um, so I, I have two questions. Some of the early work from Amartya Sen and uh, subsequent work from Dave Donaldson that emphasizes how connection to a free market uh -huh. can, be a pan can be an antidote yeah. in the face of some kind of natural crisis like this, unless there's some actor intervening, preventing people from getting access to you know, aid that they might uh -huh. otherwise be able to get on the free market. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious about what might be the barriers. In this case, it seems like the big barrier is a lack of precipitation or you know, wrong amounts of water at yeah. the wrong times. <laughs> um, what are the ability of these smallholder farmers to use the political system to advocate for water rights? Um, and the, you know, that would maybe preclude the necessity to move. And my second question is, um, you know, relates to um, um, the sort of, uh, you know, the, okay, my second question is, if we are thinking about climate change as the problem here, if that's the root of the problem and we're only expecting that to get worse, um, are we just buying a little bit of time by introducing new agricultural techniques or are we just delaying the inevitable um, or uh, do we need to look for other solutions other than yeah. helping these people mm -hmm. stay in place um, or do we uh, or is this going to be enough for them to um, stay in place even as climate change yeah. gets worse? Yeah. I'm smiling because a high-ranking U.S. government official asked me that question like two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> the second question, um, <laughs> like, but will it? <laughs> um, so, all right. So, on your first question, um, there there are kind of varying levels of political institutions in Central America, right? Um, in terms of ability to participate in um, in your political system, um, corruption is very, very high across these countries. Um, governance scores are not particularly high. Um, 
It's interesting, El Salvador has an extraordinarily popular president who is, you know, fairly authoritarian in his tendencies, including he wasn't supposed to be able to run for re-election and ran for re-election, right? Um, I, I, mean, I mean, huge. I mean, but, but people really like him, right? Um, where and now both Guatemala and Honduras have recently elected, um, you know, new administrations. Um, and in the Guatemala case, with very strong support from the indigenous communities, that has historically not been the case, so it's actually kind of interesting to see what happens going forward. The lifespan of uh, environmental activists in Central America is not per particularly high. <laughs> like there's really well-known cases of people just getting killed, right, um, by being, you know, especially indigenous environmental activists. So is that a measure of ability to participate politically? I'm not sure, but, um, you know, also uh, people being displaced from their land. There's a lot... I would not say that farming communities have particularly strong influence on, um, on political outcomes. Um, a lot of, so Insight Crime has done studies on um, like municipal level um, where lots of, lots of mayors of towns are on the payroll of the drug cartels that are moving things through. So I'm not sure exactly what, um, what recourse you have. I'm in the process actually of trying to, <laughs> so far not successfully, um, trying to work with um, survey data from um, the LUFHOP survey in, um, based in, um, you know, in Latin America, but um, the America Barometer survey for these three countries. Um, I have to be, I have to, do things with the data that I don't quite know how to do yet in order to make them look representative of the, of the populations. But that will allow me, assuming that works out okay, to ask questions, to look at their questions that have things like faith in municipal governance and other things like that and see if that affects here. On your second question, um, I mean, it's a really good question. Like, are we just, is this just a Band-Aid that, um, you know, I guess my immediate reaction is even if it's short term, it still might be worth doing because no one wants these people right now, right? Um, like I don't know what the alternative for these people is besides having an option to grow things on their farm because the United States is not going to revise their migration policies anytime soon. Um, Mexico has become increasingly tough on migrants um, coming. And one of the interesting things that I find is I've given talks like this um, to areas in the U.S. that are particularly rural. This resonates with U.S. farmers, many of whom are actually on the, the right side of the political spectrum. I actually think there could be really strong political support for helping smallholder farmers um, in Central America, especially if you can tie it to migration. I don't know what the other options are for people right now because there's not a lot of there are not a lot of job opportunities within these countries. It's not they're not ripe for a huge amount of urbanization with lots of growing jobs and, and like there's even within urban areas people you know people get an education and struggle to find a job that is um, commensurate with you know the education level that they have. So even if it were just to allow the countries to kind of get through the youth ball, to get to another stage on their um, own you know, development trajectory and then have people moving in from rural areas. Um, but on the flip side, it, it is possible that some of these areas will be able to farm and um, shifting crops, um, l looking at more commercial crops, um, looking at farmer co-ops that would allow them to produce in larger quantities so that they can, you know, have better negotiating power with markets. Um, all of these things are, are possible, but it might be growing different things than what they have grown before. But it is not true that it is impossible to grow things there. It is true that you need to use different agricultural techniques and maybe even shift crops. So um, I guess... This is one of the things that I love about, you know, things about international development. And as countries develop, more people move to the cities and, you know, less people are in rural areas. But somebody has to grow food. Um, and, um, and most countries want to have some level of domestic food production. And so I do think there is a role for this even long term, but it might not look the way that it does now. I do think that even short term, something that allows people to feed their kids who don't have any place else to go is probably worth doing. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. This was super interesting. Um, I'm wondering, so because it's so difficult to tease out 
climate as yeah. a driver of migration, um, especially if it's like a compounding factor. Um, obviously, there are implications for why you would want to identify the climate migration as like a distinct situation um, in terms of like mitigating emissions or adaptation from sending locations. But do you feel that, um, or like, what do you feel is the importance of distinguishing between? migration generally and climate migration from like a U.S. policy perspective or in receiving locations, let's say? Yeah, I think it's, it's, um, it's a very good question. I think there are a couple things. I mean, from one perspective, it, it shouldn't matter, right? Um, from one perspective, a migrant who is, who is coming in is a migrant who is coming in. And then you can differentiate based on skill levels and other things, but um, you know, most people would consider you know, these are, are lower education level migrants. And you know, so why should it matter whether they're coming for, for climate reasons or not? Um, I think, I guess I would say a couple of things. One is that climate impacts tend to seem to be causing, at least here, like big increases over a short period of time compared to just like a, a normal, you know, life cycle of economic migration type of thing. So being able to prepare for large increases in migrants um, and potentially most of these migrants too didn't want to leave, right? Like they had chosen to stay where they were and then they got hit by droughts and so they decided to leave. Um, so that can allow us to think about early interventions in places where people don't want to migrate where we could potentially say this looks like an area that is ready to ex you know, potentially experience a big ballooning in climate migration, we could invest in them there. Um, you know, from, like, from a US perspective in terms of migrants coming in, you know, I think it's actually important to keep several, <laughs> several things in mind. Migrants on net are good for, for, good for economies, right? Um, I try to be very careful about this because this is actually a very, um, I don't think we should be. I don't think we should be going around saying, "Well, we don't care if they get driven out of their country because they're going to be good for our economies, right?" Like that's not the message that I'm that I want to send. Um, it's certainly not the message that resonates with the American people right now, who are thinking that they want um, lower lower levels of migration. But the economic evidence is that migrants um, are actually quite good for economies. Become entrepreneurs and um, you know start small businesses and have pat file patents at much higher rates than um, than native born populations. And even when you think about, you know, impact on services and taxation within one generation usually become net contributors to the system, even though there might be a, a short time horizon where that's, where that's not true. Um, it's also much more true if they're allowed to work and contribute to the economy. So changes that allow people to actually have jobs and um, Colombia has been experimenting with this a lot with Venezuelan um, migrants and that has made a huge um, you know, impact on the ability of the Venezuelan migrants not only to support themselves but also to contribute economically to the country. Um, so those are things that we might want to be you know, thinking about. Um, but there's also, when it comes to actual U.S. policy, changes in U.S. policy that might, even if we kept the same number, even if we kept the same number of visas, started thinking about allocating them based on need that included climate would be a potential way to decrease. So one of the number one ways to decrease, you know, quote, illegal migration is to increase the pathways those people have to come legally. We saw this historically with Mexico um, when the U.S. changed um, migration policy toward Mexico. And so we know that this can work. It's also true that because um, U.S. migration um, kind of quotas are based on population, and these are relatively small countries, they get very few legal entries into the United States. The idea that this number of people could kind of go back and wait in line, their, their grandkids would still be waiting in line. Like there's just not enough legal opportunities per year. Um, but then there's other countries that don't even reach their quota because they're like in Africa or something and not even trying to send a lot of migrants to the U.S. So thinking about U.S. policy, you know, being directed toward legal, the rethinking how we calibrate legal migration across countries might actually be somewhat helpful in this case. Um, yeah, do we have time? Is that, okay, yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. This was really fascinating stuff. Uh, I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around, around the differences between the countries or the lack thereof. Yeah. Because I guess if this is a story about people learning or getting networks uh, internationally and moving directly to international migration rather than going to the cities, or if this is a story about different crops being affected 
differently yeah. or different types of governance and trust in, in governance. I would expect those things to be somewhat different across countries, if not even across regions. And therefore, I would expect more difference across countries than, than we're actually seeing, right? So I would just love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so actually, let me just push. So say a little bit, what differences would you expect? Not knowing the context enough, I would expect that agricultural stress might affect different crops differently. Okay. And that those crops are spread differently across the countries uh -huh. or the regions. I would expect that uh, gaining networks in the US rather than in a city close by in the same country, if nothing else, would happen at different times yeah. in different countries. Um, and I would also expect that at least marginally, there's some difference on the extent to which people trust local government or something like that. And, and, and I think that's also part of your story. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually, it's the, the last part is not actually part of a story that I can tell yet. I actually hope it will become part of a story we can tell, but I don't know what, it'll, what it will show. It's one of the things I want to test. I don't know what the answer will be. Um, I actually think that the lack of finding differences here is part of the story. So a couple of things, I mean, there's so these three countries are I mean they literally share borders right so they're located very close to each other and within reasonable proximity like similar proximities to the United States all three of them have histories of migrants going to the United States and of return migration from the United States right so I don't know that there's a huge difference like that way but one of the things that really strikes me if, if, if it were the migrant network story like if that were the main thing driving this that didn't change in 2014, right? Like that was like, that's been true since the 1980s or so, this kind of back and forth migration between the US and Central America. Nothing magical happened in that in 2014. What happened was there was a drought, right? Um, and the same thing with 2018. What happened was there was a drought, right? And so the thing that did change was this huge, you know, agricultural stress effect that really hit this dry corridor that runs across these three countries. So I actually think that that lack of difference is part of the story, that they got this similar climate. Do they grow different crops? Absolutely. Um, and is, it affecting, is climate change affecting the different crops differently? Absolutely. So one of the, that, that um, a department in Guatemala that had that biggest level of out migration, um, that is a big part of that is a coffee rust story, which is different than the story I was saying. But it's still a climate impact story, and it's still this kind of same drought that was allowing diseases to flourish there that hadn't flourished there before. Um, so yes, it's not a, you know it, it's not the same impact, but these same weather phenomenon are affecting different crops differently, but still affecting them at the same time, right? And so I think that's actually. Like I said, I thought El Salvador wouldn't show. So that to me was like, oh, wow, something really is going on here that is not as country specific, but is actually being driven by this common phenomenon that hit across there. So the last question, I think, from the audience uh, here on Zoom. So they said uh, from Christian Espinosa, he said, you mentioned the Guatemalan indigenous communities a few times. He's currently um, attending uh, from an indigenous community in Huehuentenango where he's carrying out field work. Will this research show a strong correlation between agriculture and stress and migration? And um, I'm wondering if you could comment on the mechanism of climate-induced migration. In his research, there is no direct link, a line between crop failure and migration, but a set of complicated feedback loops on local household economies. And one something which is a bit related uh, to that is that if you know what is the level of uh, US state uh, government funds aimed at ethnic uh, problems. And then another question. Um, okay, so on, um, I mean, one of the, I'd be, um, so first of all, I'd be happy to follow up off, offline. Um, so, cause I'd like, I'd like to know what they're looking at in order to kind of look at those mechanisms, because one of the reasons that we actually did want to just look at the raw impact, like the actual climate impact is because it's very difficult to, um, you know, to trace through the, you know, to trace through all of these things. So we just, we literally wanted to say, if there's an impact um, in these regions to, you know, an agricultural impact, do you see um, an increase 
in migration. I will say I didn't show the results here. Um, I think they're somewhat less interesting, but I still think they're important. We have put department fixed effects in this regression um, or in these regressions. One of the reasons I say they're less interesting is because some of our variables don't vary over time. So then they drop out. Um, really the only ones that stay in are agricultural stress and homicides. Um, but the results are still quite strong with, um, so this does seem to be a difference across time within departments um, that, we're, that we're picking up. So, but I, and the survey evidence that I've seen that has come out of places like Wei Wei Tenango has um, shown that large numbers of the people who do migrate from there do mention, um, you know, um, impacts on agriculture um, for, for why they are um, migrating. But I, you know, so I'd be, I'd have to know a little bit more about what they're finding. Um, but, in terms of what was the second question? The USA, if you know that the, if their uh, governance funds are aimed at ethnic problems as well. Um, I'm sure they say that they are, um, whether or not. So one of the things that um, a lot of international um, NGOs and, and advocacy groups have really been pushing the US government to do more of is to work directly with local um, organizations and they don't. Um, and so they will contract with like a big group that will then go in and work with local populations. But, um, and I'm sure they'll put language in there in order to win the contract that says that they will, but the US government is not really monitoring this, right? Is not really checking to see if this, you know, is being um, disproportionately targeted to indigenous or, or you know, ethnic minority. I mean, I want to be very careful. And in, in Guatemala, indigenous population is almost the majority of the country. So I don't even want to say ethnic minority um, communities. Um, but I, and the government, it's, USA does not go to the central governments, um, but it usually goes to large scale organizations that then can distribute it, um, you know, subnationally. And they're not working, the US government agencies are not working directly with the local partners. And so I don't know. And last question from Gina Davis. She said, El Nino events historically vote for below average precipitation in Central America, especially in the dry corridor, and below average uh, crop yields uh, for staples such as maize in the region. The 2014, 15, and 18, 19 years and your research uh, highlighted uh, as high stress years were El Nino years. But climate change is exacerbating and changing climate modes such as ENSO and El Nino. Did you notice in your research whether there was a longer term correlation looking before back uh, before the 2010 between migrant peaks and El Nino years? That's actually, um, it's a really good question. We have not gone back historically. Um, I will say that this year, the projections are um, for agricultural yield are down again, which would be in line with, um, with that, whether it will lead to a, an increase in migration. Obviously, I don't, I don't know yet, but um, there is this kind of strong trend. You know what's something that's really interesting? I'll end up with this kind of interesting um, side anecdote. I was at a presentation that I, thought was going to have nothing to do with anything that I do, but you just go to presentations sometimes, right? And um, the person ended up talking about the, um, the ocean oscillation weather patterns like off of the British Isles and the impact that that has on agriculture in the UK. And it sounded very similar, though obviously happening in the developed countries, so the impacts on people are not the same, but very similar to the types of um, things that we see with the um, El Nino Southern Oscillations in, you know, in the Americas. So I was like, oh, wow. So that, that might be a, a neat thing to explore you know, going, going forward is um, thinking about you know, other places where we would expect similar climatic patterns and what we might see um, see there, um, you know, in terms of, well, I shouldn't say similar climate, but this, this idea of these, you know, these rotating annual um, types of patterns and what impacts those might have on both crops and then on migration. Thank you. Thank you very much for...